ain't got it. Bro, 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 fat bro, we ain't got it. Don't spend no money, ain't got no clothes, ain't got no cars, ain't got no hoes. We bro, bro, bro. Let, let, ladies and gentlemen, who now this name? Welcome back to Turbo Trumps. It's your boy Phil Chad, aka Flip and Floss, the big boss, baby. Aka Fizza P, aka Filthy Phil, aka DJ Mkarad, aka Sexington Lovu, and of course, Shamari, you think it or drink? Still out here in Johannesburg, and I managed to rope in. Some might say a sexon, some might say a budding thespian, if you will, a brand ambassador for several brands out here. He's doing a lot of big things. The, the ladies flock to him. <laughs> Social media magnate, none other than uh, Mr. Masejo Maps Maponyani. How you doing, sir? Oh, Bo, I'm good and you, man. I'm great. <laughs> Trying out my Shona there. What's up, man? Ah, you see? It's, it's Ndiri, Bo. Oh, yeah. the Bo. Yeah. There we go. Uh, this is easy. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Lost you. <laughs> How are you doing, sir? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. On the show, man. Oh, Filthy no. Phil. I didn't know that. Damn. Yeah, tell me yeah. about that, man. Ah, yeah, um, <laughs> no. Okay, don't uh, tell me about that. Let's go straight into it. <laughs> it, it was a sullen night in Bangkok. <laughs> I had wow, Filthy shots. Phil and Bangkok. Let's rather go on to something else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Um, I don't know. How do we begin this? Because you, you have a reputation for being um, a very likable, a very popular... A very well-known individual but up until let's say i think because i'd seen you here and there for a while and you're getting a lot of popularity on social media and whenever i'd come down to south africa people would be talking about you and we'd ask exactly what is maps specialty people would be like we don't really know but he just does everything yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i'd say i'd say my specialty is actually people more than mm-hmm. anything else um i think my my ability to form and structure relationships uh, pardon? <clears throat> and structure relationships is probably the the root of of any success that i've um mm-hmm. that I've had in a sense that um I love all things uh fashion media creativity entertainment um and things that allow me to uh really yeah i say create more than anything mm-hmm. else um and also um, i'm a I'm, I'm big in entrepreneurship. I'm big in the business mm-hmm. um, sort of side of things. I love um, taking risks and, and jumping into all of that. And I think as much as I love all of that, whenever I do it, I try to do it as as well as possible, as reliable as possible, um, and be able to maintain really good relationships. And from that, from people seeing the work ethic and you know, I try to put in as many hours with whatever I do as much as possible, that word of mouth spreads. And forming those relationships with people from knowing that they won't be let down, so to speak, and that they'll always get, um, you know, the best from me is something I think that um, has made me sort of realize that perhaps that is what I specialize in. And, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like that's what life is all about at the end of the day, at the end of the day whether it's a business or, um, or just general life or whatever it is. Relationships is, is, is what it's all about. But, um, yeah, besides that, Thinking out of the box um, is probably my my biggest specialty. Reinventing myself, not limiting myself, being a bit of a multi um, multi potentialite, a multi hyphenated, multi faceted type of person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love trying to reach as much potential as I can, and not limiting myself to one thing. Also, in the South African entertainment industry, if you want to limit yourself to one thing, then you want to limit yourself to just being poor. So that's 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 great too. <laughs> but that's not what I was really going for. Um, so you know, I've always believed in creating different sources of, of, of income streams mm-hmm. and really being a person that at the end of the day owns their owns their space, um, owns their content and isn't always asking for the next job and looking for the next job um, and just waiting for it. I've always been wanting to go out and create it and convince people that they need something even if they don't need it. Um, and then once it's actually done and they do it with me, then they realize, damn, that was actually well worth it. Mm-hmm. So I think I've gotten pretty pretty good at doing things like that and um yeah now i've sort of gotten to where where i am now it's been a bit of a tough journey it's been um about seven years and i've been i've been blessed man i've just been having the the most um the most 
fortune, but um, it's come with a lot of tireless nights, um, sorry, sleepless nights, tireless work. Um, I'm in the office pretty much every day till about 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Okay. Um, and yeah, I work about, I'd say average about a 18 hour day on, 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 on the average, 18, 19 hour day, average three to four hours of sleep and hustle. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's that old adage. A lot of people quit their day jobs to become entrepreneurs so they can stop working 40 hours and work 100 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly what it is. But um, while I was researching this interview, I think you were actually one of the quintessential people we started Two Broke Trumbos for because you're extremely popular. But a lot of people have not explored your story. It's pretty... Yeah. Like every interview I came across was, oh, Maps, you're sexy. How did it, how did it feel winning the GQ Sexiest Man Award? Oh, no, isn't that the worst thing? Aren't you in a movie? What's your favorite color, Maps? Mm. Hmm. Mm. Do you like ice cream? Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which, for me, it, it's, it annoys me because I feel that you have actually, while I was reading up on you, you've got an interesting story that people would, would love to hear. Yeah. So I think let's, well, before we get up to the 18-hour days, let's start at the beginning. Yeah. So your dad is quite popular, apparently. Yeah. What is it like growing up in a home uh, where your father was a popular a soccer player, and how did it affect your upbringing? Um, you know, I always actually say this that to me, my dad was his dad. I didn't know what was happening. Mm-hmm. I just thought he had a lot of like um, cool friends that really <laughs> liked him. I thought he was just like a really nice guy, and everyone wanted to be mm-hmm. around him. You know, they always wanted to take pictures with him, and I don't know why he always had to keep signing stuff. Mm-hmm. Didn't make any sense. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't understand the concept from a very young age and then as I grew older and started having sportsmen that I idolized and everything I understood that my dad was actually this person mm-hmm. and um, yeah I think in, a, in, in many ways seeing his his interaction with people and um, you know his his respect for other people and the way he handled that so well and being a generous uh, type of person gave me a lot of traits that prepared me for going into Mm-hmm. into the industry but growing up was 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 quite interesting it was pretty tough growing up with uh with uh, with a dad like that in a sense that um you know i had to be the next footballer after him mm-hmm. and the pressure was relentless i mean i'd play any game of football and from i was kicking a ball from about two years old and already people are like hmm, i don't know if he's like his dad you know, I mean that 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 three year old, that two year old kicking that ball don't look like his like it might be like his dad. And then, you know, my whole life, no matter what I do, no matter type of um, performances I'd have, it would always be that comparison. Um, you know, one of the things I I always laugh about, I refer to, and I happened a few times where I'd maybe score a hat trick, set up a couple chances. People would uh, I'd come off the field and it'd still be people saying, oh, your dad was scored five goals in that game and set up three chances or four chances. Um, hit a volley, top corner, and my dad was really known for um, for doing a bicycle kick. Mm-hmm. And that was one of his trademarks. And not even a volley was good enough for me. I, I had to do a bicycle kick. You know, <laughs> like Dad would have done that as a bicycle kick, made it look easy. But he was just also just that good. The bar was just so high. And I think... Immediately, I was up against it from from the word go. You know, from the moment I popped out, and we're in a society in South Africa. Um, not entirely sure if, if 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 other nations across the African continent, if if their people are the same, where they put that much pressure on you. But in South Africa, like if you are the, um, if you are from from the loins of a of, of a famous person that did something, you need to do exactly the same thing as them, and they'll con- constantly exactly. compare if you you know if you if you're going to be like them. Um, whereas I feel like in in the West, it's almost like a support to get you there. Like okay, okay, there might be something there, you know, could be could just like you know maybe maybe but let be like his dad, whatever it might be, um, or yeah, and and I think that made me slowly lose the passion for for football and I was lucky that he never put any pressure on me mm-hmm. and then I just went on this mission to find what made me happy and then I ended up where I ended up I actually when I finished high school I was always that sort of nerdy kid um, you know a bit of an overachiever and tried to do you know all the extramurals all the sports did pretty um, well at school wanted to go study overseas everything and then I and then I decided to take a gap year when things were a bit tricky back at home and wanted to um, work things out and see and see what I could do and on my gap year I wanted to make 
money. I wanted to work out how I could make an income for myself. And I knew that I loved people. I knew that I loved talking because from the from the, yeah the first words I spoke to about the age of twelve, I had a severe stutter, and I wanted mm-hmm. to use my my overcoming my stutter that I had as a disadvantage to my advantage to make me an income. Like that was my plan, and whatever I do in the future would involve me doing a lot of talking, and. Um, you know, just like right now with all the talking where you can't even get another question in, um, <laughs> I, I, I worked it all, all out and, you know, really learned to sort of, um, I think, grab a hold of, of, of language and articulation. And I went for, you know, auditions for TV presenting and everything. And that was my first job. And that's how I got into the industry and someone said, you know, you should try some modeling. A few people were saying that and I was like, oh, I don't know about that. It's not really my thing. And then I tried it out because, you know, I was just about to be a student and you, when you're young, you just want to make any extra buck here and there. And then I started that and then it was just frustrating because it was audition after audition and you wait in long lines. And, and then I got a couple gigs and then, yeah, the work started coming in. I was taking it more and more seriously and at the same time, I was doing the TV presenting. And then I went into studying the following year. And I was working and studying at the same time. I was running from audition to lecture to uh, to presenting job. And then back home, catching up with work, um, not getting much sleep, going to varsity, getting the lecture. Right. Where were you everything. studying? I was studying at WITS. Oh, okay. What, what did you study? So uh, I went to WITS. Um, uh, wanting to go into aeronautical engineering. Oh. But the way my life was set up at the time, I ended up um, thinking, you know what, this is, isn't is actually what's going to make me happy in the end. It's going to be something that's very limiting. It's going to keep me um, solidified in one place um, in, in the terms of like routine and not really being able to just uh, go with the flow, so to speak. And you know, the other options were architecture and law. And I ended up just thinking, I want to be a whole lot more liberal um i was a big reader and i wanted to uh, be exposed to all sorts of things i loved languages as well and i was quite interested about the rest of the world and ended up doing a quadruple major in english french media studies and international <laughs> human rights okay okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Hold on. There's, there's, there's a lot of leads that you've buried so far but this is probably the most intriguing because a lot of people would see you and they'd be like oh look pretty boy he's a model he's probably ditzy but you, you just mentioned... I don't read, right? I just yeah, read magazines. You know what I mean? <laughs> or I read tweets now. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty. I take photos. <laughs> but you just spoke about aeronautical engineering. That's, 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 uh, that's, it's not, it's not s- small stuff here. And then you want to do a quadruple major. How did this all come about? Like, were you always, did you always have this intelligence and work ethic from, from being a child and being under the pressure? of trying to achieve all these lofty goals everyone else has started set for you? Or were you just trying to prove everyone wrong? Like, if I'm not going to do sport, I'm going to be amazing at something else. I think, I think a bit of both. You know, I think, I think I was sort of inspired listening to the journey that my father went through to be the footballer that he is and leaving the legacy that he has and having gained the amount of respect that he has uh, managed to accumulate and gain. And I was sort of thinking, well, I have the up on him the up mm-hmm. being the fact that you know you always want to be better than the last generation exactly, yeah. and the up was that i went to a damn good school because of the sacrifices that he um had gone through so which school me, i went to i went to st john's well, i went to two schools oh okay. i went to king edward primary school and then st john's for high school mm-hmm. st john's college and it was a nightmare for my parents to like put the cash together to get me through those schools like we were always quite tight with um, with cash because of it you know you get mm-hmm. those times where you can't even get your report because fees haven't been paid yet type of vibe and those skills were were in me I was like I've got the best sort of start and he only got up to matric and he went to school in Soweto in the township mm-hmm. so I have no excuse but to be greater um, than than him he's given me all the skills and that would be any father's dream to be able to pass it on to their child so that they can outdo you. And I think that was, that's just been my, my mission ever since. You know, the, the journey's been treating me well so far. There's a long way to go. Sure, I'm not a famous sportsman because that's what immediately brings people together and people adore that. But, you know, achieving greatness in my own way is something that I'm 
after something that I really want to be able to um, to be able to to get and I'm far away from any of that right now you know all the modeling and TV presenting cool that's fantastic but how does that really change um, change the world what does that really do what does it actually mean and how significant is it so you know I like to focus my energies on a lot of things that can do something like that and you know the rest as much as I do love it is just something that um, just something that I enjoy as as a bit of a pastime um, and as as just another element of me but it's not where I focus all my energies on mm-hmm. if that makes sense okay okay um, you've got a brother, right? Yeah, Catholico. He's older than you. Yes, older brother, um, six years older. He is a DJ. Wow. Um, he's a he's an events manager, so he puts on a lot of big concerts in in, in South Africa, mm-hmm. um, and now and again in Australia as well. And he's a professional snowboarder. So uh, where? Yeah, huh? yeah, exactly. Yeah, huh? in 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 Africa, right? He grew up in Soweto. Yeah. <laughs> and he, on the, the the streets of so I don't I don't want to use the normal word, the dusty streets of yeah. Soweto, but how do you? Yeah, you kids are something else, fam. How do you think of that? Like you in Soweto in South Africa? Yeah. Outside of a few cold nights in Joburg, snow doesn't really fall in this country. Yes, yes, yes. And then how do you even practice snowboarding? Where do you so, go? So it was just just one of those things. We're quite lucky in our family that whatever sport we pick up, um, you know, tends to. Mm-hmm. Not take us too long to get uh, reasonably good at it, and basically he went to Lesotho because there's um, something ah, called okay. SA Champs that happens yeah. in Lesotho, and it's usually you know these um, families that go snow um, go on skiing holidays and everything. Mm-hmm. I've never touched snow. My family's never been <laughs> to a place that has snow before, and him and I used to skate growing up as well randomly, mm-hmm. you know. But he was always just like always um, skating a lot, and he got really good at it. And he, for fun with his friends um, during varsity, he went to SA Champs to go see the snow in Lesotho and just to like experience touching snow and everything. And then he he got dead into entering the competition for SA Champs by his friends, and he's up against like European cats and um, American guys and South African families that go skiing and snowboarding often. So this is like a slalom down a hill. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and he came third. <laughs> And yeah, he ended up uh, getting the hang of it really well. Three months later, he made the South African team, um, and then he turned pro as well. And for about five years, he would do six months in Europe and America, and then six months in SA. And that's what his life was like doing all the competitions there, and then coming here. And uh, at at a, at a point in school, actually after high school, the vision for me was to be a professional golfer. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I picked up golf in high school and I got really good at that and then yeah I mean look uh, I wanted to get a I wanted to go do it in the states and then I just yeah tripped up again uh, into the media stuff and then you know when you start making like a little bit of cash here and there you Mm, you you just you get distracted (laughs) you know you start thinking okay I can I guess I can do this because you can provide for yourself Mm -hmm. as opposed to doing something that requires you asking for cash until like, you know, it's that 10 year investment until you start making good cash, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's my, that's my brother. And yeah, he's, he's pretty dope actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, you spoke of the pressure you were under. What is the pressure? Like if you have any understanding what he was going to, because yeah, he's the he first was, born. I mean, he was under crazy pressure. So, so I, had, I had a whole lot more leeway learning mm. from him and my parents learning from how they brought him up as well, mm-hmm. um, putting him under you know a lot of pressure. They're a lot more relaxed with me, so I was allowed to make certain decisions that were just navigated by my heart, as opposed to being told what to what to do. You know, my folks wanted him to be a lawyer and go into that, and you know, um, it was, it's a very big thing in a in a in a black home to you know put a lot of money into your child's education and then. They go and, you know, inverted commas, disrespect you by not going into a proper career. You know? Oh, don't I know that part? Oh, Ooh. Yeah. I know. I mean, the last thing they want is a filthy fill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you want someone that's a decent doctor. Yes, <laughs> doctor, engineer, lawyer. It's the only acceptable profession. Everything else is a failure. Exactly. 
the other issue that you you seem to have brushed over but seemed pretty remarkable to me is you spoke of how you had a stutter yes from when you were a child yeah and you came or not only did you overcome it but you decided to take up a profession that flew directly in the face of, of what that stutter limited you from doing yeah how did okay first of all how did you that stutter come about and then how did you gradually overcome it yeah so for, from the first words i ever uttered i had a stutter and mm-hmm. it was really tough you know just being able to um well trying to speak and then always getting made fun of um my mm-hmm. parents were always just like just talk man just talk and it's not that easy mm-hmm. just had a big jam in in my mind that wouldn't allow the words to come out marching in single file um the front line of an army you know just that i wanted that orderly that orderly conversation to flow easily and it was hard to articulate anything and it was it was very painful but you know with with a lot of reading a lot of reading out loud a lot of practicing pronunciation of words a lot of training to slow down the speed of my brain so that my mouth could catch up with it mm-hmm. and getting that sort of cohesion in the end was um it was quite an empowering moment. I always get asked what my greatest achievement is and, you know, um, there are a lot of things up there, but there is no greater achievement for me than having gotten over the stutter because that empowered me to do everything else. That empowered me to get my next greatest achievement, which is graduating. Um, and then, you know, next greatest achievements, which were, I guess, getting to my goals. You know, there mm-hmm. were certain things that I said, by 21, I need to be able to do this. By 22, I need to be able to do this. 23, whatever, whatever, whatever. And it's all worked out um, swimmingly uh, <laughs> because I because I got over the stutter. So <clears throat> that for me has been the root of of all my success because my self-esteem had changed. The way I treated people changed because I knew what it was like on the other side to mm. be um, you know to be looked down upon or to be ridiculed for something you had no control over. Um, and yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's something that was, that was quite a distinct moment. I'm not not sure if you ever watched King's speech, but it was exactly like that. Okay. Um, and yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful thing to eventually, to eventually get there. And now to be able to speak in, in different languages and, and flow is, is quite beautiful. So yeah, but what's fascinating about that actually, I mean, I speak about seven languages, but for some reason. In my mother tongue, that's the only time, you know, I'll speak, I'll flow easily while I'm having a conversation. But in my mother tongue, that's the only time where there might be a stutter just like crop up slightly. Mm-hmm. Because that's the first one I ever, that's the first language I ever learned. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I was getting over the stutter, <clears throat> the speech therapist taught me how to get over the stutter in English. Mm-hmm. So it may sound like it doesn't make any sense, but the brain had already conditioned itself to speak a certain way in my mother tongue. When mm-hmm. I got over it in English, was preparing for something else, which you use in a different way. Um, so, no, I speak, I mean, I speak, um, I speak my mother tongue fluently, but that's n- now and again, if I get too excited in it, it will like slightly creep up on me and just be like, yo, homie, remember me? <laughs> and um, then I need to remember I'm just back, like slow son. down. <laughs> no, no, it's more like, I'm b- 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 back, son. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but I actually, I actually can relate because I have a similar issue when I speak in Shona. Because mm. I also used to do the same thing. I used to do like this. Hi, guys. How are you doing? I'm feeling like, okay. I need to see you. Oh, really? Okay, great. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. And I had to train myself and learn yeah. how to speak slow. But when I speak in Shona, sometimes it just be a mess. Yeah. But it's also because I suck in Shona. But <laughs> different story. Wow. So education. After attempting to do aeronautical engineering and your quad major, did you finish those degrees or you put those on the back burner for your career? Um, well, I, I ended up just doing the quadruple major because mm-hmm. aeronautical engineering, there was just no time to do. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I finished those degrees. I did, I did the whole uh, quadruple major. So the quad and major was in what? English, French, media studies, and international human rights. Okay, and my question is, who are you trying to impress here? I mean, <laughs> why, why, what is this? What, like, what is know, this a benefit? My thing was like, if I was going to do a BA, I wasn't going to do an ordinary double major. No offense to mm. that, but like, I wanted to do it so that it really challenges me and it's something that's extremely, or well, mm. a lot more substantial. And, sorry, and, and that's what I ended up doing. I just wanted to make it as, as challenging as possible because I figured everything I do is, is a, it has a reason for sort of preparing me for the future. And this was going to prepare me how to be able to juggle different things, how to really push myself, how to manage my time and realize that there is more than enough time to get certain things done or uh, what you need to get done. And it was quite funny being in varsity 
with people just doing a double major and not doing anything else, like mm-hmm. out of varsity, but complaining about how there's no time at all. And I'm like running from this to that to this to that, living off three, four hours of sleep, two hours of sleep, all nighters. And, you know, I mean, I'm not not in any way um, better than anyone else. I was just always, with, I'm always just sort of wanting to test myself unreasonably so. And yeah, I think, I think, you know, if it leads back to, you know, exactly what does he specialize in? I think it's that whole like confusion of like, damn, he's here, he's here, he's doing this, doing this. Um, that sort of throws people off and I've never wanted to be the ordinary, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's part of the associations I have with, the brands I have associations, associations with like Investec for, for example, you know, I'm mm-hmm. the Investec private banking ambassador. Um, and their slogan is out of the ordinary and it's really just about 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 things such as that. Um, it's about um, pushing yourself, reaching your potential and making things happen for yourself. And that's what I've always wanted to do. I've never wanted to sit still twiddling my thumbs and ever getting to a point where I just might use the, the B word, which is which is bored. And I don't think I've ever been bored since I was maybe nine years old watching TV. Okay. So that was between 2009, 2011, the, the, quad, uh, the quad major? And that was between 2010, 2013. Oh, okay. Yeah. So while things were taking off, you you were still finding the time. Yes. To do it. Wow. Yeah. So 2012, 2010, 2012. Yeah. Okay. 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 So let, let's discuss that. So while you're doing your degree, you're now foray into presenting and modeling. How does that go about? And when do you start realizing that? Wait, there, there seems to be a a potential career in this. There seemed to be a potential career in it for me when I did my first. Uh, episode of TV presenting mm-hmm. uh, I sort of like got caught by the bug immediately I just loved it and you know in school I used to be doing all the school plays and everything um, and there's always sort of been a passion there to be a a conduit um, of entertainment for for people to to enjoy so yeah I think there was always there was always the sort of appeal and love for it from me immediately it was just going to be how long was it going to take to uh to really make it something solid and to be able to um make a name for myself in the in the industry Mm -hmm. and then it was being willing to put in the work and being patient and um not losing focus and as i said earlier being reliable and delivering every time under promising over delivering and yeah how how was i going to how was i going to change the game you know and one of the small things that i wanted to do was be able to do that being myself the whole time so i remember when i started modeling for example a couple of agencies had been like ah oh, no nah, it's not going to work out because you know you got glasses and people don't model with glasses it's just not cool and you know what you actually very commercial yeah, you would never really be able to do any fashion weeks or whatever. Your look's not really something that's going to work out, especially if you don't want to take off those glasses. So I was like, cool, whatever. Just left and basically went to the next agency and said, okay, the glasses, this is me. These aren't coming off. This is um, what I'm like. Uh, and this is my vision. I want to do this. I want to do this. I don't want to do that. And I think from coming in there from such a hard point of view, and then being like, okay, we'll see something, was was what changed it all. Um, not going to say I ever started it or whatever, but two years later there were clones everywhere because um, things were, were rolling in and all of a sudden glasses were Shots the thing. Fired. Shots fired. Um, <laughs> and like the fashion side of things were taking off. I was GQ Best Dressed Man um, and I was doing all these campaigns. I was always with my glasses and then a whole bunch of good, uh, other guys on the come up and stuff. Um, so you try to creep up there. Mm-hmm. Other guys on the come up and stuff who were wearing glasses and literally, literally clones, like trying to have their entire look mm. with the haircut at the time, whatever it is. And that ended up being the thing where agencies were actually, well, and, and uh, brands as well, were actually trying to make sure that, you know, they put glasses on people and everything. And then mm. just in the general South African public, 
in fashion whenever classes now with the, with, with, with the thing and now it's something that's hung around and something that's still around and yeah it's really funny though and it's very frustrating the amount of people that, that send me lookalike tags on Instagram or Twitter or whatever this guy just looks just like you and it's just another black homie in glasses <laughs> and that's the only thing we have in common <laughs> but wait Maps I thought all black people looked alike <laughs> apparently not <laughs> Okay, wow. Um, while you're doing all this, are you actually uh, going back and doing some sort of maybe formal training, training yourself on how to model, how to present, practicing in the mirror with a hairbrush? How, no. are, you, how are you increasing your professional capacity? No, I mean, with modeling, I've done that for about six, seven years now. I've done, well, I've done numerous, numerous campaigns. Um, I've done about 45, I think over 45 TV commercials. Hey, look at you, um, huh? Look at you. <laughs> different print campaigns and stuff. And with that, with that, I'm fine. I'm not going to... Um, I've actually decided to put that on the back burner a bit unless it's, um, you know, big international jobs. Uh, my focus is a whole lot more mainstream now to just doing bigger and bigger and better things. With presenting, um, it's always sort of fun learning different parts of, of, of presenting. So trying to fine tune different elements and that you never, you never have nailed a hundred percent, no matter how good you are at it. Like there's always, there's always different sorts of personalities you can add to it. So that's always fun. Cause you just go with the journey as to where being you can take you on, on whatever show you might be doing. Uh, so yeah, but the thing that's constantly needing a whole lot of work and is always a, a great challenge. You always need to research on is acting. I mean, that's something that is, really really um a beautiful a beautiful metamorphosis in the way it it challenges all parts of you and with all characters being so different and 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 so difficult to to tackle in a different way it's it's a it's a great thing but but no um i think i've got a lot of my focus on on business um mm -hmm. i i'm a I'm a bit of a VC. I'm a venture capitalist, so help a lot of uh, startups get going. And I have a couple startups of of my own as well. Uh, I work in the tech space. I've got a few tech apps, um, fashion and um, and winery as well. So I got oh, a, wow. I got a champagne. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite busy on that side. Um, running about uh, well, well, I say I say running, but uh, director and also running about uh, four four different um companies and stuff which has been pretty challenging but um it's exciting as well you know time management is 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 what it's all about and it's never been more demanding than it than it is right now but it's all it's all going to be worth it in the end okay what's the name of your champagne uh, it's called gm and Irons. it's in um france oh, okay. and yeah it's a it's a method cup classic because technically you can't call a champagne a champagne unless it was made in Champagne in France. Of course, I mean <laughs> everyone knows this. I mean this is common knowledge. Please, maps. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what what which apps have you invested in? Uh, so got an app that we. Okay, firstly the one's a music app. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a company called Nestream, and basically we make niche music streams for uh for different niche music markets okay. and so we the first one we just rolled out right now is uh called leaky and mm -hmm. leaky is um mean song in in afrikaans and or, or track and it's a exclusive afrikaans music streaming app with exclusive afrikaans content on it only and you can download and stream afrikaans music over the last 60, 70 years or whatever it is, purely for the Afrikaans market. Super loyal. Okay. Um, they they love that they have something for themselves and where they can enjoy everything that they um, that they have ever wanted. Um, you know, a whole bouquet and choice of different types of Afrikaans songs over the last 60, 70 years and all you do is pay a subscription. And then the other one, we're going to roll into another big market that's also super loyal and faithful and loves their music and exclusivity is Niger Gospel, Nigerian mm -hmm. Gospel. And then we want to go into European EDM and then maybe some South African Gospel and then some Texas country. So really focusing on those niche markets and um, giving them their own platforms where they can have their own music, not inhibited by any other types of 
um, genres. So purely just purely just that. And then I've also got a um, an educational app that came out three weeks ago called Tutami, which is T U T A dash me. And basically, it's the Uber of tutoring services that is soon going to be taking over Africa. Um, <laughs> basically, what we do is we provide tutoring services to you at your convenience. So if you are in primary school, high school, varsity, or just anyone at home, and you need assistance with a certain subject, you can literally go onto our app, go to the subject you need help with, the level you need help with it at. Um, it picks up your location. It finds it the nearest tutor in your area. Book a time start. They come to you, have an hour lesson, cashless service, just like Uber. As soon as you're done, money off your account, you've done your hour lesson, and that's it. So if Phil's going to Germany um, in a couple of months, and he's going to be there for a while, he needs to have his German wax before, because it's hard to just read a book and learn it alone. Mm -hmm. You need a tutor. You don't know where to go. You go into our app, Tutor Me, German, beginner. Um, it finds um, it finds Franz, um, who's in your area, who happens mm -hmm. to be a German guy that lives in, so in South Africa or, or, or wherever you're living right now. And he comes to you, does your hour lesson, um, and then that's it. And you keep booking slots, you keep doing that, and then your German's good, and you got all the basics before that. So it really is, um, it was initially really just focused at varsity and high school students who need help with their subjects, um, maths at whatever level it may be. So just give them that educational support to improve the level of education all around. Wow, that's actually quite a massive app when you look at the scale of it. Yeah, it... Um, it, it it all becomes about scaling now, and if we do it right, it's going to be huge. The interest is insane that we've been having. The amount of um, you know investments that people have been wanting to pour into it is great, and this is something that could take on um, take on the rest of the world in quite a big way. And uh, yeah, the main thing is just you know making sure that um, all the tutors are continuously vetted, the experiences is uh, is on point, and that they're trustworthy and everything. Um, which we have access to all of that because we make sure we screen all of them first. Um, and once all of that is sorted and it's a re reliable service, the sky's the limit. Okay. Especially okay. because we're going to roll out with different things as well as it expands. So there's going to be a cooking element too, another app for that, and there's going to be a personal training element to it and all sorts of things. So all of those are already in the work and they're going to be coming out soon. Wow, you're an intriguing man, Mr. Mapanyane. <laughs> well, we're limited by time, so we've got to wrap this up. Uh, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about was was acting in the, um, your movie debut in uh, Tell Me Sweet Something. Um, how did that come about? Well, how did that come about? Um, auditions. <laughs> <laughs> auditions, 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 and it eventually worked out. Honestly, when I went for audition, I don't know why I was getting asked to do the audition but i just decided that year that i was going to get into acting and yeah um the director i worked with was actually at the top of my list of the director i wanted to work with in south africa as like my dream director and my first audition with him went really really well i honestly thought that he wanted me audition to just be like you know the guy that walks down the street in the background mm -hmm. um and then maybe just like do oh hey that's i don't know whatever it is and i ended up apparently doing quite a really really good audition and he ended up casting me as the lead and that was uh, an incredible moment best experience i've had great working with all the people i worked with co-star was incredible and the whole team was incredible and then you know a month after that i ended up um also acting in ayanda which is also mm -hmm. a very successful local film and it's been fun acting is is uh is awesome i love how i love how tough it is and I love the amount of work that it requires. And I love that I have such a long way to go. All right. As someone who's, who's clearly got an interest in business and investing in themselves, um, I remember there was a time Akin was, was talking about how he felt the movie had not been given its fair time on the circuit. Yeah. And you're obviously now in that industry. Have you ever thought about starting maybe your own production company, distribution and something like that? Yeah, so I just started a production company. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> just started a production company right now, but we're starting very small, um, filming a lot of our own content, uh, just like uh, fresh young videos to um, get brands um, to be a whole lot more um, cool and fresh with their content, providing a lot of that, coming up with uh, dope TV shows and everything. 
and really trying to revolutionize that much that side of, of things as much as possible. And then eventually, um, well, there's uh, there's another TV show that doing a lot of producing in right now, and um, eventually, hopefully, going into some film um, producing and uh, yeah, exec producing and see how all of that goes. I don't know if I would ever go into directing or anything, but mm -hmm. yeah, I just I just love I love um, making making art. Okay, um, can you name some of the shows or, or brands you might be working with? Um, brands might be working with well regarding uh, regarding um, like the videos and stuff that we've mm. shot. Uh, did something for for Jaguar recently. Mm. Um, I did a road trip with the with the XC. Okay. We did a pretty cool um, thing on their side there, and then work on a, it's either going to be on SBC three or ETV. Working on a a new sort of a model search show with a with a different angle altogether from what you've what you've seen, um, which is due to start at the beginning of next year. And then there's a movie I'm doing some exec producing on right now, which is going to be focusing on um, King Leopold's and uh, the Belgian um, atrocities that happened in uh, Congo and okay. the treatment of the Congolese people. The most swept under the carpet tragedy of all time, um, which was um, far more extensive than the Holocaust, in which mm -hmm. over 10 million people were um, were horribly killed at the hands of the of the Belgian. Wow. You're a very intriguing man, Mr. Mopin. I'm um, <laughs> sad that you do time constraints. We've got to end it now, but we're going to have to follow up. because Yeah, we'll definitely have a follow up. Because there's a lot more we need to delve deeper into. And yeah, then yeah, we'll yeah. Probably follow up on the, your projects and, and, and how you're doing. Yeah, hopefully I'll be the one on the other side interviewing you. We can interview each other. I'll be like, yo, what's <laughs> up, guys? This is Maps Opnani, a.k.a. Maps, a.k.a. Google Maps, a.k.a. Messy Maps. Uh, I'm not quite filthy full, but I hope that's all good with you. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Hopefully it will. So if you do want, you know, you know, what I'm saying just to boost my popularity, just you know, yeah, story yeah, yeah. my way. You know, I could use it. I could use it. <laughs> we are a we are a burgeoning but award winning podcast, uh, might I add. So oh, fantastic, yes, man. Yeah, yeah, and then your right. African hip hop blog is also mad dope. So yeah, yes, yeah. yes, that's also an award winning best blog yeah, in Africa. I know, 2015. I know it is. I know it is. See? I done my research too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. Thanks, I appreciate it. Like get out of my boardroom. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note guys we're out don't forget dan is still in zim holding it down there we, we've got a, a lot of good interviews lined up there should be a, two nigerian superstars um uh, once this interview drops so look nice. out for those and guys this one, once again let's not forget to help dan get a passport fund um i've got a co-host named dan and He's, he needs a passport he doesn't have a passport because he can't afford it that's oh, the name of the show two book two both. so we're, we're trying to crowdfund yeah and hopefully he can get the 50 dollars he needs to go to the passport office <laughs> get his passport. help dan get a passport guys <laughs> since we are at investec i mean guys let's talk <laughs> but on that note mr Mapunyani, thank you so much for your time we appreciate it this was a great conversation great interview actually i think a lot of people are going to find out stuff that they had no idea about you thank you very much man and on that note we are out <laughs>
kisses. So no, kidi na kote le tama fifi ya we both no. Na le when I read it na dizi we go easy when we busy le ratola pelo ya me please don't go. Anka tu me la kenya but you just tell me right on. H O M G. He just asked me what I'm doing when I said I like beat. To all the haters, chill and begin ya na R I P. So sit down here while I'm on and I say this. You used to like it when you called me. We stay up all night. You say that I'm yours and I say that you're mine. You send me little kisses and you put a little hearts. You blow my mind. Nobody else, just me and my B A E and we K I S S I N G. Ooh, 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 come give it to me one more time. Kisses, 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 kisses.